Uh, hey, so I think, uh, are we live? I think we are officially live. There are people watching, and we are now in complete control of Excellent. this webinar. Excellent. Uh, so my name is Kent. Uh, I'm with Blurb. Uh, my job title, sort of mercurial, but I'm sort of a you know, kind of creative resource here. I do a lot of writing for the blog. I do events. I do a lot of talking to this guy. Yeah. Some photography when they let me do it. I don't even know what your title is anymore, but it doesn't really matter because you do so many things. That's true. And this is Dan Milner. Howdy. I work for Blurb as well. I work, uh, my title is photographer at large. I have a, a fantastic job that revolves a lot around being a liaison between groups like professional photographers and Blurb itself. So I do a lot of educational work. I do a lot of workshops. I do a lot of lectures. Talk to him a lot. Talk to Alistair a lot. Talk to Christina a lot. So uh, travel a lot. Get, get to be out in the field with people like yourselves and uh, hear what's, what works and what doesn't. And so Dan, why don't you, for the uninitiated, before we kind of dive into Lightroom, talk about Blurb, talk about what Blurb is and uh, how people use Blurb. Okay, well I will give you my interpretation of what Blurb is, if that's okay. I think Blurb is a company, it's, a, it's an independent publishing platform, but in essence what it is is a platform of tools that allows you as an author to publish uh, a book or a magazine or ebook or a combination of those items in virtually any number or quantity that you want. And not only it allows you to create those, but it also allows you to distribute them uh, to any demographic or audience that you choose. So you can sell books directly or you can sell through Amazon or Ingram. And uh, in essence now, as an author, you basically what I do is I figure out what the goal is and I work backwards and choose the tools that Blurb makes to help you facilitate whatever it is you want to do. Yeah, and um, while we started out talking about Blurb, we know that most people are here actually to talk about Lightroom. And that's what we're going to talk about. And I think this is very interesting because, Dan, we've known each other for I don't know, like three years or so. Yeah. We've uh, done shows and events and things like this. We've got some history. Yeah, we've done some photography. Yeah. But you don't use Lightroom very much. Yeah, I know. And I have a lot of friends who like teach Lightroom workshops. Mm -hmm. I've actually been through multiple Lightroom workshops. Lightroom is an incredible program. I think it's the one program that jumps out at me as sort of the industry standard for imaging, imaging professionals. Uh, I'm so antiquated in what I do and how I work that I sit down with Lightroom and I think this is an amazing. I should be using it, and I should, but I don't. So I'm curious as to, uh, for the layman like me, yeah. How you're going to oh, help yeah. me understand so this? So my, my goal is to convert you to Lightroom by the time this is you, this is over. You've got a mountain to climb. All right. Um, so w you know one reason that we really do like Lightroom a lot is that Blurb is actually built into Lightroom, and we're going to talk about that um, a little bit more as this as this goes on. But first, kind of want to get into like what makes Lightroom really great for photographers in general. I was at an event recently in Toronto, and I uh, met a photographer there. And he was, he really wanted to do a book and he was, he was asking me how, how he should do it. And I asked if he used Lightroom. And he said, oh, you know, I, I downloaded it, uh, but, uh, you know, I just I have too many photos. And I said, but that's, that's what Lightroom is for. Yeah. Lightroom is for cataloging your photos. It's for getting all those photos together and then being able to, like, organize them. And so I kind of went through, through it, you know, just in a couple of minutes. And I don't know that he was converted exactly. Yeah. But I bet he went home and, and, and kind of started to play around with it. Yeah, because if you have too many photos, the first thing you've got to do is figure out an asset management program to handle all those things. And that is the industry standard right now. So if everyone I know, for the most part, uses Lightroom. So yeah, that's, and I think everybody's living in the age today where we all have too many photographs. Yeah. You and I work a little differently because we use so many different kind of formats and right. things. But I've noticed looking at your Lightroom catalog that you've got your Polaroids and you've got all these other things that you shoot, scan, and still put in there because in essence at some point in time you're going you're gonna to want to find something. Yeah. So um, for those of us that don't know Dan and I particularly well, we both shoot um, a lot of analog. So again, Polaroid, 35 millimeter, you know, we, we, we shoot some digital. We, doing that right now. Yeah, um, nailed it. Know, <laughs> six by six, I mean, just a lot of different things. And when you have all these these files, whether they're, you know, whether they're analog or digital, and they sit on your hard drive, it's kind of hard to really get a, a sense of how many there are, and then to find them when you're done. Fi just finding things in general. I mean, if you look back over the past 10 or 15 years of my life, how many hard drive systems I've, mm -hmm. I've had, how many I still have, how I've labeled things. So having a central access point is, for your sanity, is really a necessity. Yeah. So like the, the basic things that make Lightroom I think really good, first of all, it's um, what's called non-destructive editing. What is that? What is non-destructive <laughs> editing? editing? Um, so 
kind of used to, you know, a lot of times when you're working on a file, you're actually making physical changes to that file. Mm -hmm or you know, digital changes that file. And then things can be kind of irrecoverable at a certain okay. point. You can, you can totally change something, and if you, you can like save over it. And then there's no going and back. And there's no going back. And what non-destructive um, uh, editing is, and I, I know there's like lots of technical ways about it, uh, but what, what I've read is that um, you have a raw file that you're working with, yeah. and then actually all the changes are not happening to that raw file, but in the accompanying file, which I think is called an XMP or something like that, but don't quote me on that. That sounds pretty smart. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you can actually go back to what you were doing if you made some changes that were unwise, or if you're making some changes for a specific publication or something like that, yeah. and then you're doing something else and you want to be able to go back and then make changes on top of the original. Well, I always understood raw files to be, the, the way that it, they were described to me that I really liked was a safety net, that it was a two-stop exposure safety net, and it was an untouchable file format. So what you're saying is that Lightroom allows you to go in and make your adjustments without ever touching that original file so that it's safe no matter how many times you save it over in Lightroom, you can always go back to that original file and retrieve the basic information that came out of the camera. Yeah. 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 That's, that's the beauty of digital, really, is that safety net. It's a, a digital negative. Um, and then the other great thing about Lightroom is it's a cataloging system. And if you kind of, we can switch to my screen right now, um, you're going to see just like a, a massive just number of photos that span work. Most of this stuff is work and also some personal projects um, in here. And it, it's a way to really view all of your work at once and then to be able to sort through it. And that's one thing I'm going to go into a bit later because that's really important. Sorting. Yes, because we all take a lot of photos. Like, probably more now than ever before. Probably too many. Probably too many. Yeah. And Lightroom lets you go through and kind of, um, you know, uh, rate photos and then filter them and then only deal with the ones that you really want to deal with, which goes a long way towards creating a book or something like that, which brings us to another reason why we like Lightroom, which... Because you can make books. You can make books. Yep. And um, I, I told you that Lightroom, for me, is the start of every book that I make with Blurb. And see, that I didn't know that, and that that's fascinating to me. Yeah. And... That's both the books made within the Lightroom book module, but also stuff I do in InDesign and stuff I do in our own tool called BookWrite. So you mock it up in Lightroom first, regardless of how you finish it. It's really about preparing the images first. Okay, you that know, makes sense. It's uh, when I scan stuff, I scan it as TIFF. Okay. You know, and I scan it huge. Yep. But I don't need files that big for the books that I'm making. You're doing that because you never want to have to go back and scan right. that again. Yeah. It's a one-time scan. One-time scan. Right. Which I read in a blog post you wrote. I'm filled yeah, with information. You don't want to like go back and rescan negatives again and right. stuff like that. So um, always keep it like this big TIFF file, but I can always export it as 300 DPI JPEGs for use from of Lightroom. Life, from Lightroom. And so when you are dragging images into a book, everything you do is started in Lightroom. So you're prepping your files exactly the way mm -hmm. you want yeah. before you pull them into the into the book. Yeah. Your images are perfect when they when they're pulled into the Blurb software or as perfect as my images can be. Right. You don't want to go back and forth. Yeah. Correct. Put it, put an image in, and then realize it's not the density's wrong, or you've got to spot it, and you bring it back out and start over. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, Lightroom helped me create. I know one of your favorite books, Photo Chicago. Of course. <laughs> Which uh, it but, should have legendary a subtitle. Well, legendary. legendary. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, but you know, Lightroom does allow you to make really you know fantastic books um, that really show off your work. And I know you're going to talk a bit about. The importance of making books yeah. later I, on. Well, obviously, we both work for Blurb, but I think our, our sickness goes a lot deeper than working for Blurb because we've been making books for a long time. We have, yeah. And uh, I think we're, we, you know, we have a problem. We make so many. We do. But it's a good problem. So kind of the basic layout of Lightroom, it, it, it can be a little um, uh, overpowering, I think, when you first look at it. If you're used to working in Photoshop, which is very much about doing one photo at a time. Yeah. Lightroom is about w looking at all your photos, working on them all at once, so you really get a consistent look to everything that you do. Okay. So the basic modules here, you have the library module. This is kind of where you're going to do your importing. This is where you're going to look at what you have, where you're going to edit your photos, and ultimately decide what you're going to work on. Uh, next to that at the top here, we have the development module. And uh, this, is where, this is where the work happens. This is where your non-destructive photo editing um, actually happens. Okay. And um, you can make all your changes there. Next to that, we have Map. And I will admit to you, I do not use Map. That's interesting, yeah. I... Because my cameras, <laughs> like this one, do not have GPS. That doesn't have GPS? That does uh, not have GPS. What a shock. But if your camera does have GPS, you can automatically bring in the coordinates for your photos. 
that's kind of cool. Pretty cool. Yeah. And actually, even if it doesn't, you can you can actually uh, put that stuff in by hand. And if that's something that's really interesting to you, uh, I've, I've been to Lightroom meetups where people really really geek out on that because you can actually you know show your whole photo walk. Yeah. That you've done. Well, I actually saw there's a really good bookmaker here in San Francisco, and I went to a presentation that he did where he actually built that screen grab of where he shot all the images in the book and built it and physically printed it out, and it was a part of the book, and it was really beautiful, and it yeah. showed the, the sort of exhaustive approach that he took to the project because there were a lot of photographs. Um, and so, yeah, people totally, some people totally love to do that. Uh, the book module here, which has blurb kind of built into it, and we're going to talk about that more later. Uh, slideshow um, is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. You can do wonderful little slideshows for, mm -hmm. you know, presentations and things like that. Next to that is print, and that's for doing kind of like manual outputs of, of you know, okay. if you want to print. And then next to that is web. Uh, something I haven't done a lot of, but what's really cool is that uh, there are ways that you can you can have your photos automatically update to your web page. So if you have a a catalog or a portfolio part of your website. There's different plugins that you can use in order to actually uh, create a sort of dynamic web gallery that's automatically going to update, and that will save you all kinds of time. Well, speaking of time savings, all of these modules and what this program is about, in essence, is, is efficiency, yeah. because everybody's creating all these images. And unless you sort of harness the post-production of your work, it has a tendency of really taking taking over everything that you do. And you come back from these shoots and think, oh, man, I have to sit down and now I have to manage all these files. The efficiency of the program is really nice. And the fact you don't have to leave the program to get to all of these things, making a slideshow, doing your maps, yeah. developing your files. That's really what everybody wants is to be able to just sit there and be efficient and get what they want the way they want it as quickly as possible. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to take you through like a, just a bit of the workflow that I use. This okay. may not be the best workflow. It's the Kent workflow. Because I tend to work very intuitively and perhaps inefficiently. But um, uh, All right. We're, we're, we're related in that way. So um, the, you can import. That's kind of the way that most things start. You can pull directly from your camera You know, if okay. you're doing raw files. Uh, like I said, since I do um, a lot of analog and a lot of my stuff is scanned, I'm almost always pulling from my hard drive. But either one uh, will work. Um, so here. I'm just going to, as these photos load in, they are all selected. And I'm going to hit import. And you're going to see them it's fast. populate. Yeah, it actually is, because these are some pretty big files, which is, which is, which is kind is of Is this impressive. photo Chicago? No, <laughs> this, is actually, uh, <laughs> this is actually New York. And um, I shot with the roll of Oh, I see some and, Polaroids. And some Polaroids, yeah. and so. But are we supposed to call those Polaroids? Those are impossible. They are an impossible project, but they yeah. were shot with a Polaroid camera. So OK, well, then it's, we're safe. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I do when I get these photos back, um, you know, I can look at them in this, in this sort of large view to make sure everything's there. Um, but you know, it's kind of not big enough to really make judgments on. OK. So uh, there's different ways you can view it. I kind of go for this nice large view. What's cool is if you have like two monitors, you can actually have the photos go like full screen on like yeah. a second monitor. And get you have your tools on one side and your image on yeah, the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's nice. So I get into this um, pattern with the number keys. OK. And I use these to go through. It's just left and right. OK, not very exciting, right? It is for me. <laughs> but uh, you can also use your number keys to rate your photos. Why, why do I need to rate something? Because you shoot so much that you probably ultimately only want to deal with the good stuff. They're not all good. That with, with yours, they are. But okay. With mine, you, you've seen it. So basically, what you're doing is you're you're filtering. I'm filtering. Yeah. To get to the the good, the good, yeah, the good, the yeah. better, the best. And usually, what happens is, uh, you know, I go on. It's it's a five point rating system. Okay. And, and I decide I'm only using four and above. Uh, but then by the time I'm done, I realize I have so few four and above that I lower my standards. But that's just me. But that's you. It's yeah. intuitive. Yeah. Uh, and so you kind of have to be pretty strict here. Because you really want those five star images have to be like those are your lifetime images, strict, right? Strict, but relative to my own. Strict, prowess. because you don't want to end up with you know if you're not strict enough, you're going to end up with a with a category five that's got ten thousand images. Exactly. In it. So and there is no category six, right? Nah. No, not yet. No, uh, but it's really quick. So I might go through and I might say this one's a five, and I might say this one's a four. Um, please, no one judge my judginess. Uh, this one I'm going to say is a two. Uh, you know, again, I wasn't like crazy about this. Uh, boy, that was way too dark. That's going to be a one, you know. 
I mean, of course, all this stuff I can change. That's a five. That's a five. That's a five. Slam dunk. Yeah. That might be the cover, right? I hope so. Yeah. And so I'm going to go through. And I might decide later that, you know, actually, hey, you know, that was pretty good. And I, I, I can go back and. Yeah, you can change all this. And change that, yeah. Um, I like that one. I'm going to do that a five. And then I would just go through and do this. Now, if I'm really, really efficient, I'm actually going to also use keywords because we talked about cataloging. Yeah. Right? And cataloging is very important. And to find stuff later is yeah. a big thing. So um, on the right here, you have different keywords. You have keyword suggestions. And these are actually um, suggestions based on things that I've already done. But okay. it's actually kind of smart. Um, so so you're, can, you're just looking for descriptive terms yeah, to associate with yeah, these so you can retrieve them yeah. later. So let's say I'm, I'm down here with my Polaroids, and I want to make sure I can pull out my Polaroids later. And so I'm going to click these different keywords. Is that Coney Island? Set. That is Coney Island, yeah. I knew it. So, um, and I might make a keyword you know, for Coney Island and you know, different things like that. So okay. that it's very easy for me at the end. Because at this point, I may not know what kind of book I want to make or what kind of photo set I want to make. Yeah. But then if I decide, oh, you know what, really the Coney Island work is stronger, I can pull those out because I've already keyworded them. Do you have a set of keywords that apply to all of your images? Is it Kent Hall, 2014, anything like that? No. That's, okay. To me, that's just kind of too much, right? All right. I, I, I know they're mine. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have had some of yours in there. so you know. How I, did I, that happen? I think you said I could use them. OK, whatever. Um, so I'll anyway. So uh, we'll go through and we'll just we'll tag a few more. That, that one's a four. I, I love trash. You know that's a four. You know we're going on a four. That's a five. These are nice. I like the Polaroids a lot. Thanks. Um, and so you know we've gone through here, and if we had spent a lot of time on this, we would have given lots of keywords to mm -hmm. everything. And uh, if then if we're back out here uh, in our large view, if you see down here, there's a little thing called there's there's little filter things, mm -hmm. and you can start filling those in. And then it eliminates. Yeah. And so you see, wow, really? I kind of didn't take as many good photos as I thought I did. So you're basically selecting the four and five star only. Yeah. OK. So let's say that I'm ready to develop these. I'm ready to work on them a bit. Yeah. I would just go here uh, to the develop module. And then you'll see down here at the bottom, because my filter is the same, I'm only going to be dealing with those photos that I actually deem worthy. All right. And that I actually like. You've still got quite a few. So I quite a few, and I would go back, and again, I would lower my standards, or I would think, <laughs> what's the truly, you know, appropriate, uh, you know, because you've done stuff before where you're like, oh, that's a terrible photo, but then kind of working on the whole set, you go back and realize. Do you throw photos away, like permanently? Yeah. No, because digital storage is so cheap. Good. That was the answer that I was <laughs> looking for. No, I don't throw anything I wasn't, away either. I wasn't sure. Because you don't know. You're going to go back and find something ten years later that you overlooked. Yeah. Or someone says, you know what, I really you know, need an image of this or that. Um, I'm going to pull in some different photos now that are, kind of, that are digital. OK. Because you know, I, I know that that's the way that most people work. And it's kind of easier to show off some of the development settings here. Um, so um, also, you don't have to import everything if you want. You can just, you just highlight you the ones can just, you want. Yeah, grab a few. Got to love the SX-70. Come on. That's slam dunk. So anyway, we'll import these. And again, we talked about Photoshop. A mm -hmm. lot of people kind of you know, cut their teeth on Photoshop and got very used to taking one image and kind of like really, really refining it. And then you, you close that window, and then you open another one, or you keep multiple tabs. Um, what we're going to do in the develop module mm -hmm is look at all the different things that, uh, that you can do. And a lot of these will look very familiar if you've used Photoshop before. Uh, there's temperature, which is cool. Even I've used Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, tint. You know, um, exposure, which you know, I, I kind of like the exposure now is much more common than just um, like the contrast and lightness and darkness. Mm -hmm. It's really more, more photographic and I think more true to you know, how light works. Now, this is a pretty efficient way of working, too, because your images have been imported into the develop module. And you've got all the, that tool palette down the right-hand side. And that's allowing you to make quick adjustments on basically every aspect of that yeah. image very, very quickly. And then also, I'm guessing that you can save that mm -hmm. and then apply those to images across the board. Yeah. 
So this is these are some photos that I did for work. So you know, I used the uh, I used the digital camera, and I wanted them to have a very like clean, very consistent, kind of like very scientific uh, sort of look to them. So you know, I really want to make sure that like the whites are like really white, and these are things that you can do in in, in Lightroom that are really you know kind of kind of nice to get this exactly how you want. Uh, clarity is one that I totally overuse, uh -huh. um, and it just it's kind of like. I don't know. It's like sharpness. I don't know what it is, but it, it, it's it's not just sharpness. It's a bit of richness. Um, is it a little HDR-y? No. I okay. Wouldn't, I wouldn't just say checking. HDR, but um, it's just it's really it's really nice, particularly for for digital work. Um, vibrance and sat saturation. You can do the tone curve. Um, darks and shadows and lights. This is pretty amazing. With with shadows, you can pull stuff out of your photos that you think actually are not visible. Um, well, the digital cameras see so well, especially in, in dark environments, that yeah, it, it'll record things that you didn't even, your eye didn't see. Yeah. And one thing that I, I, I really always do do uh, with digital is um, it's kind of amazing. Adobe has gone through and made calculations for virtually every lens out there. Lenses, you know, have aberrations, distortions, sure. things like that, and they have corrected them. Wow. Which, from a film perspective, seems kind of weird, but if you're doing like, especially like product stuff, and you yeah. want things to look like really clean, can um, enable the profile corrections. And what's really cool is it actually knows so many of them just based on whatever sort of magical coding mechanisms are inside cameras. So it already knows the camera and the lens. Um, so this is particularly true with you're using close-up lenses and things mm -hmm. like that, or telephoto, things where you're going to have like some barrel distortion, and you can actually look through and see it change. It's it's really it's really pretty amazing. And then you can decide even how much. Uh, if you look, I'm going to like really kind of mess with the distortion here. It doesn't show as much because this was a, a macro lens. But um, if you uh, if you use a telephoto lens and you have a building where there's like you can see a big bend in it. And you correct. Actually, yeah, you can actually correct that. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I like it because again, as you said, you know, I shot all of these in a studio. The yeah. lighting Controlled conditions environment. were exactly the same across all of them. So um, I can um, copy, or I can add these to a collection, um, or I can actually copy the settings and yep. then paste them to the additional ones. And Select all, copy and paste. Copy and paste. And yeah. that saves me a lot of, you know, I don't have to do a macro or something like I might do in Photoshop. Well, I think, again, too, it speaks to efficiency because what I've, you know, it's very easy to put a digital camera in your hands and get a little bit sloppy because of the capabilities of the software on the backside. Yeah. But what people should realize is the sharper you are in the field with your settings, even more efficient, the potential for being more efficient is in, is in the software is there as well because if your exposures are consistent across the board in the field, when you bring them in and you make little adjustments, you have you have fewer adjustments to make in the software than you do in the field in the camera. So this is great. We're shooting all these images. You can make adjustments on one, copy those, select and paste yep. for the rest of them, and get your base adjustments yeah. done within exactly. literally minutes after importing an entire shoot. Yeah, and you know, you know, you shoot you shoot Polaroids. Yeah, you know how sometimes the white border isn't quite white. Yeah. Right. Once you find that setting, that's something that you can easily, you know, copy and paste. Copy and paste. So if you go to develop settings here, you'll see that you can copy settings, and it's actually going to show you which one. Everything you can yeah. copy. So actually, there may be some that you don't want to bring over because maybe yeah. lighting conditions were, you know, different. But you do want to bring over, say, the uh, the lens correction and stuff like that. Copy it. Select additional ones. We're going to be really hacky and just do it to all of them. What's wrong with hacky? I live my I like life, it. Um, and then you can paste the settings in there, and then suddenly everything has that. That's a little blown out there, so I would I would edit that. It looks kind of cool, though. It does look kind of cool. Yeah. So anyway, consistency, and yes. you know we can always go back and we can always look at how things look together mm -hmm. and make sure that they really are, do look like they were shot at the same time, the same day, and that they will create a consistent body of work. Consistency. Consistency. It's key. Um, so, uh, you know, again, we we're, we just have a select group of photos that we yep. that we did by by rating them. We have made some changes. We've copied and we've pasted them. Do you think we want to make a book? You always want to make a book. I do. I do always want to make a book. Yes. Um, so we're really happy to be part of Lightroom. 
I mean, Blurb is built right into it. I get a lot of comments from people about that, how often they use it, how much they like it, what they want to see in the future, et cetera. So you've made over 300. 200. I knew oh. you were going to try to sneak that in there. I'm not that bad. 200 is totally acceptable. No, 300 is out of control. Yeah, no, that's too yeah. much. Um, so I think you're probably the best person to say why it's important to make a book. There are so many reasons why it's important to make a book, but ultimately what I like about bookmaking is that it forces you as a photographer to make decisions about your work. And it's very easy to shoot photographs and it's very easy to throw them around in the digital space looking at thumbnails and doing things very quickly. But when you go to make a book, it forces you to make concrete decisions, meaning you've got to choose a cover image. You've got to edit what images go in that book. And when you start to pay for books, you're paying for page counts and materials and things like that. You don't want to put things in that you don't need to have. So it really forces you to, to look critically at your work and choose only what you need. And it also teaches you what works and what doesn't work. I actually think, and this sounds like a total, a total line, and yes, I do work for Blurb, obviously, but I think making books makes you a better photographer in the field because it makes you sharper in regards to what you're doing. So you go into the field and realize, I don't need 10 images of something because I'm only going to be able to run one of these. I should be able to make something that's good enough in a single image to convey what I need to get across so that your book ends up being a book of really solid work all the way through. I think uh, you have to edit your work. You have to sequence the pictures as well. And anytime you can direct critical thought towards what it is you're doing, I think the better you're going to be. And I think one of the things that I, I would suggest to people is to not stress over trying to make the perfect publication. It's so rare that I make something that I get back and think this is absolutely perfect, exactly what I wanted all across the board. There's typically one or two things that I think to myself, oh, I could have tweaked that, I could have maybe done something different with the typography. That's the fun of it. So I've made a lot of books. A lot of them are books that I learned from that weren't necessarily books that I would hold aloft and say, look how brilliant I am as a bookmaker. It's one of the most entertaining educational things I've ever done in photography. And you know, sequencing, which you mentioned, is really important for development as a photographer. And Absolutely. I think, I think books do it very differently than, than, than online viewing of images. Absolutely. I mean, I did a portfolio review a few months ago, and there were a lot of other reviewers sitting around, and we were talking, and people were saying, look, these, the people who are coming up with digital presentations have a tendency to have not edited as tight as they should, because it's very easy to just leave things in and mm -hmm. flip through something on an iPad. The book is a, is a different kind of commitment. And what sequencing will do, you can literally sequence a book correctly, put it in front of someone, and watch them take the roller coaster ride of mm -hmm. that book. Yeah. You can take the same book, take two or three pictures, and put them in the wrong order. And they will not only not take the roller coaster ride, they won't get past the first or second spread. It's that critical. It's a puzzle, and there is no perfect right and wrong. But I've been around photography and around books for a long time, and I've seen people who are picture editors and book editors for a living do things with a sequence that absolutely astounded me in terms of I would look at something and think this is as good as it's ever going to be, and they would take those same images, subtract a few, change the position, and completely alter the impact and the story of what was in front of me. And it, it's astounding every time I'm, I see somebody that's that good do that. And pop quiz? Yeah, go where ahead, you, hit me. Where do you put your best image? Oh, well, it depends on what I'm trying to do. Now, I know that's a really good question. So typically, people would think, well, you, maybe you put that on the cover, or you, you end some, with something really strong, or it's the first image of the book. I think all of those are potential answers. But I've also started to design books with the front matter replicated in the back of the book. Hmm. Because so many people, when they pick up books today, they don't look from the front. Yeah. They flip to the back. And my wife said to me, stop complaining about it and design the back of the book identical to the front of the book. And I thought, that's a great idea. Yeah. So now my best image might be on the cover. It might be the first image or the last image in the book. It's true. I've noticed that I do that. I go to bookstores, and if it's an image-rich book, first, I, I don't know if it's left-handed, right-handed, but for some reason I, I go through books backwards. A lot of people do this. Yeah. I think people are. I think m the majority of people are right-handed. Mm -hmm. So the book goes in their left hand, and they start doing the work with their right hand, and it turns out to be the back. I don't do that. I look at books from the front. Huh. But I am a model citizen. <laughs> you are an eccentric. <laughs> um, so you can make a book right from within the Lightroom? Yes, you can. Leaf. And you know what I actually really like about the Lightroom books? And I have made a Lightroom book, mm -hmm. even though I don't use Lightroom on a, on a regular basis. 
what I love about it is the books that it really sort of channels you into making are relatively basic books. You mm -hmm. can't get too over the top in terms of design and, and use of typography. I think that's a really good place to start. And a lot of the books that photographers or image makers are going to make are obviously image heavy things. They don't require a lot of over the top design. So I think Lightroom is a really efficient way of getting into the book world. Um, Kind of the best way to go at making a book, we talked about you know, filtering and things like that, mm -hmm. is to start from um, a collection, which I think I kind of skipped over a little bit in the beginning. So you want to go back to it now? I'm yeah. totally fine with that. You can, it's your web and but I mean, you do know, whatever you want. That Lightroom does allow you to like really kind of go back and forth between different things. It's not, it's not so step by step. You can really go back and forth. Um, and one of the great things is, is when you're making a book, you can actually still go back and adjust your images. Well, that's what I was going to say. You, you can do all this without leaving Lightroom. Yeah. So you can pull from collections. You can put an image in a book and then realize the density's wrong or the contrast or whatever. Go back to it, correct it in Lightroom, and it makes the changes in the book. Right. Yeah, that's, that's cool. So um, collections, again, really vital way to organize your photos. And you can do that uh, here. Check out my screen here. Click the plus that's next to collections. You can um, cr create a collection, which is just going to be a drag and drop thing, or you can create a smart collection. That sounds witty. If you're, Let's do that. <laughs> if you're one of those people that uh, that really likes to like, you know, if you've gone through and you've really carefully tagged everything, like I was talking about. Yeah, that's me. Right, and you rated it correctly. You could say, you know, I want it to be a five star, uh, all four star photos that were 35 millimeter and color. Um, I'm not going to do that because I did not carefully tag you did the not. photos that I imported here. Uh, so I'm going to create a regular collection, um, and we're going to call this the, appropriately enough, the camera collection. I get it. I get it. <laughs> I sharp. see the connection. And I'm going to create that, and it automatically added that in. Um, it always you kind of want to go, go want to go back to your previous import a lot because mostly you're going to be looking with the stuff that you brought in. If you ever get lost, if you ever wonder kind of where where things ended up, they're going to be there. I'm going to drag it into camera collection. And again, you're going to see that um, looking at it here, all those uh, settings that we did in the develop module are mm -hmm. are there are reflected. Um, and if you go into the develop module. Um, over here on the um, on the left side, you see. I was talking about non-destructive photo editing. You actually see all the different iterations of this. So, um, you know, the, at the top is where we did the most, right? And then there was exposure, but you can actually go back and see how it looked at the original import. Okay. So in the book module, oh, it automatically populated the book. It, done. It, <laughs> You're done. Yeah, I had all, all those photos selected on the bottom, and it thought. Um, That's what, what you I wanted. wanted to do, um, but I'm going to clear out this book because I think I can I can make you some can better. You can probably decisions. do better. You uh, don't need all those photos. You don't. No. Um, when uh, first thing you kind of want to do when you do a book is uh, decide what size it should be. It's a good step. And uh, it, you know, blurb you have everything from this nice little seven by seven, which is the first uh, uh, format book I ever made. Because I was shooting square format. I think I did too. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I'm sorry. I did an eight by ten. I was shooting thirty five. Um, and then we do things like the large landscape. Um, we do the eight by ten. A lot of different things to choose from. Um, but you're going to want to kind of choose that up front. And you you have some freedom to go back and forth. But all the decisions you're going to be making are going to be kind of based on the, the the size or at least the the, the ratio of your book. Um, How many pages do you need to do a book? Minimum of 20. Minimum of 20. Yeah. But do you have, let's say that you're going to make a photography book. Yeah. Do you have to do, how many photos do you need? As many as to show how good you are. That's uh, it? Yeah. No more. You don't need 50. You don't need 100. You don't need, there's no set number of saying there's that you no, need. Yeah. I, you know, I mean, you've, you've done more, you know, books than, than, than I have. Don't forget I think, that. I think you need enough to tell your story. Yeah. And uh, I've done books before where uh, I've included 90 pages yeah. of photos. And I've watched people go through it. And All of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you a fan of single images on a page 
as opposed to a myriad of images on a page. You know, there are templates that have 8, 10, 12 images on a page. Are you pro that or are you pro simplicity and running images larger? I, I like simplicity. Uh, for me, and it kind of just, I think, depends a bit how you shoot. I'm, as you know, I'm very into um, pattern and I'm very into shape and things like that. And I think that, you know, the single image really brings out those sorts of contours. I agree. I've seen people do stuff with multiple images that work very well, mm -hmm. but um, I sort of want people to um, get into a certain image and, and kind of experience it on its own. Sometimes facing images can be really compelling too if you sure. do a left and a right page. Um, and you know, you get more for your money that way. It's true. So I'm going to choose um, a standard landscape. Any, if anyone has any questions out there in webinar land. They can fire them in. Fire them in and Dan will ask me. Some of them I've been asking. Yes. That I made it look like it was my question to take the credit, but it was actually someone else. Actually, someone out there. Full disclosure. So I'm going to choose a standard landscape for this. Um, you don't necessarily have to choose the cover type now, but it might help. Um, we do a hard cover. We do a soft hard cover image wrap, mm -hmm. which printed cover. Yeah, which is photo this kind Chicago. Of thing, uh, you know, which has no. <laughs> <laughs> All roads lead back to, to photo, photo Chicago. Chicago. Um, we do a hardcover dust jacket, um, and then we also do um, we do a soft cover. Um, choose your paper type. You can kind of do this later as well um, if you want, um, and then decide whether or not to have the logo page on, which is simply, do you want the Blurb logo in the back or not? You get a discount if you choose to have the Blurb logo. People get kind of fiery about that yeah. at times, the Blurb logo. Yeah. It's never bothered me. Most of the time I take it out but other times I've purposely left it in to see if one, anyone ever noticed it was in there, and two, did they care? I've never in 200 plus books ever had anyone say anything about the logo, yeah. but I still take it out. Yeah. And sometimes I put my own logo in, or I know a lot of other people have like a small uh, sort of publishing house or an edition house, and yeah. they'll, they'll put their logo in the back to do their own edition, so it's easy, it all works. So to, to do a book, um, you're going to see here on my screen, um, I have all my collections here that's been totally consistent throughout the whole Lightroom process. Um, everything starts and ends with collections. Um, I'm going to control click or right click on it and there's a little thing that says create book. Done. I'm going to say create book. It's going to ask me the name. We're going to call Photo it. Photo Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Revisited. I'm, Volume I'm two. never going to live down Photo Chicago with you, am I? I call it camera collection. I can kind of decide where to put it. There are some other things I can I can I can choose, and uh, I'm going to hit create. Bam. Bam. It's not exactly what I want. Okay. You're picky. I'm a little picky. Yeah. Um, but he is picky. Uh, we for have sure. a, there are a number of templates here that you can choose from. Um, you can you can add extra pages. Uh, you can create your own layouts if you want. Even that. looking at your work in this thumbnail, sort of the spread of the entire book, that's a wonderful thing because it just... Not it, the work, but being able to see Not your work, it. but you no, know, no, never. But the, the actual layout of the book itself because it, it teaches you immediately what works and what doesn't work with your sequence. Mm -hmm. And every time before I print a book, I always look at it in this form because there'll be some glaring thing that I thought was magical the way I had it designed. And then when I see it in the full layout form, I always make changes at the end. So. It's a good good way of looking at it. It is, yeah. Um, there's different kinds of things you can do in terms of auto layouts if you want. Um, again, you can add add blank pages and as well as um, do backgrounds if you want. If you want like the black background or things like that, or you know, some like kind of template things for like weddings and, and different things. Um, so that's the, the basics of making a book. There's a lot more you can do in in, in terms of in terms of changing layouts, um, you know, you definitely want to uh, do a cover. I think Lightroom for me, like any other software, it takes sitting down with it and going through the process a couple of times and learning how you interface with the program, yeah. what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm a big fan too of, of printing sample books. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of times when I first started making books, I put this pressure on myself to make something amazing and I would make a book and then order like 10 copies at a time, not realizing that it wasn't right. Yeah. I don't do that anymore. I typically will make a book and then 
print a sample copy, or I'll even print a section of the book. I'll print 20 pages of it in a small book and get a feel, whether I like it or not, before I commit to the entire print run of 50 million, hundred billion, thousand dollar books. Yes. Um, see, I, I did not edit this very well, because you can see I actually have multiple pages of the exact same thing. So I got a question for you. Yeah. It's not me. David's got a question David's for you. David's got a question. Yeah. Cool. Please explain, explain the pros and cons of using Lightroom versus Bookrite when making a book. That's a great. Oh, that is a good question. That's a great question. Should I take it? I think you should. It's your webinar. I mean, <laughs> it look, is my I'm webinar. just here. I'm supporting. Um, so I love that someone knows enough about Blurb to know that we have um, a bookmaking tool called uh, Blurb Bookrite. It's a free download from us. Um, it's, in a lot of ways, more robust in terms of layout tools. Uh, and Bookrite, we've done a, a, a webinar on Bookrite, which I think people can go back and see. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, which is and we've cool. also done a section of tips yes. about Bookrite. Yeah, we have, yeah, There's 10 of them out there, David. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Bookrite's really kind of designed more for layouts, for more sophisticated layouts. Uh, with Lightroom, it's very much a photographer's kind of layout uh, tool. It's one photo you know, per page, four photos per page, but not a lot of ability to kind of change things around. Not a lot of ability to sort of put text on top of an image. Uh, Bookrite allows you to really customize uh, your layouts. You can, you can change your yeah. text boxes. Um, you can create an ebook at the same time, which is really cool. Um, ISBN, there's a lot of things that go with it. What is different, and that you don't get exactly uh, with Lightroom is, or, or what, what you don't get with Lightroom is the ability to actually edit your photos on the fly. So right. uh, if you look here at my screen, and let's say I've decided that this particular photo just isn't what I want, uh, I can hit develop, and I'm right there. And I've got the photo in front of me. And if, uh, if I realize that you know, the color or something like that needs to change, um, you know, if the highlights are kind of like blown out or not, um, I can change that. And I can go right back into my book. And it's reflected immediately there. Um, a similar thing, actually, you know, with, with, um, with InDesign, I talked about using InDesign in conjunction with Lightroom. Um, if I'm doing an InDesign book, I prep my images in Lightroom. Before importing before. them. Uh, yeah. And um, I do an export at 300 DPI, because that's what I need to do for yep. book in InDesign. Um, and then I put my book together in InDesign. But what's cool about InDesign and the way different uh, the Adobe products work together is if I, if I need to make a change, I can go back to Lightroom, and I can make that change, and I can just export it mm -hmm. again with like the, the same settings. Yep. And then I go back to InDesign, and I click that little image refresh button. I don't have to replace the image at all, but it calls back to that file. And it, and it puts in the changed image. So just to recap that, because Denise has, has a question that's along, along the same line. So we've got, let's just talk about the three bookmaking tools. You've got InDesign, Bookrite, and Lightroom. InDesign is the industry standard for designers yeah. that, are, that are out there. So if, you're work, if you're a photographer and you're going to work with a designer, chances are they're going to be using InDesign. Mm -hmm. Bookrite is the free standalone blurb software. And Lightroom book modules obviously built into Adobe Lightroom. And to Denise and David, I think, what, what you were saying about book ride is very, very key. If you have work that's a little more design heavy, if you need to do more with typography, mm -hmm. if you want to have more control over the layouts of the book, book ride is a really good way to address yeah. that. So is InDesign, but InDesign is a bit more of a commitment. It's InDesign's a, got a big, a big learning big curve. Big learning curve. Then again, both you and I learned how to use it. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm learned just enough to be really dangerous and probably do terrible design things yeah. with it. Yeah. But Bookrite is a really good alternative. The beauty of, of Lightroom is that you're working on your images in that program, and you can toggle between your images and the bookmaking tool at the same time and go back and forth. So if you're, if you're making a portfolio or something that's very streamlined that you don't have super heavy text needs or design needs, Lightroom is a really great way yeah. to go. But it's not to say that they're the same program and they both offer different things. It's just up to you to figure out what tool best fits the need you have. Exactly. OK. Um. Uh, and what was that Denise's question? Does that answer yeah, Denise question? was asking, does Lightroom uh, Bookmaker module do everything the Blurb's own Book Book Smart does or Book Write? Is there any differences in the approach? Can you tell me what they are? Oh yeah. So again, yeah. you know, Book Write and Book Smart, we've uh, which uh, you know, two of our bookmaking tools, we've done a lot in terms of making a really great book design tool, but it's not an image editing tool. So you're always going to want to prep your images um, in Lightroom, in Photoshop, um, right, in 
you know, whatever it else it, it is that you're going to do. But you know, these, like I said, these are the industry standards. So. And for me, it's a routine. I use BookWrite most yeah. most of the time, and I prep my images in Photoshop, and I get them exactly where I want, and then I just import them into BookWrite. And it's only because I've used it enough times now that I'm very comfortable with it. Yeah. And I also use InDesign. So depending on what I want to make, I'll either choose InDesign or BookWrite, but all of my prep work is done in Photoshop, so the images are exactly the way I want them before I bring them in. That way I don't have to go back and forth. And there is no real right and wrong. It's just whatever tool best fits your application. Um, yeah, and that, that, that is a really good it is a really good question because there are a lot of tools out there and a lot of ways in which people can, can make a book and, yeah. and showcase their images. The key is making the book. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we should also point out it's probably a really good time to say that um, uh, Adobe's given us a really great deal to pass along um, that gives um, a, a Creative Cloud uh, license for Lightroom and Photoshop. Very for nice. Fifteen percent off. Ooh, nice. And that uh, will be sent out to you via email um, within twenty-four hours. So um, Creative Cloud is really great because um, you know it used to be that you were paying you know like hundreds and hundreds of dollars for for software, which was really frankly particularly when I was a student, was totally out of my reach. Right? Yeah. But now you're, you're paying like, you know, $10, $10 $15 a month, and you're getting... Um, you're getting the latest, yeah. greatest. Um, you want to say... Uh, you should well, say the link. <laughs> say the link. The link is very long, so we will actually be sending it out via, via email. It's a long link. It is a long link. Um, so when you are all ready to actually make your book, um, you do it, again, right from here. Um, we actually tell you what the estimated price is going to be, That's so nice. um, you know you can you can you know add on the extra papers. You know if you want to like go like nice you know like pro line sheets, yeah, pro line end sheets yeah. or something. You can do that, and then you'll order it um, right from here, and then you're taken to the blurb site and where you'll pay for it. And uh, you still, I believe, get a discount on your first blurb book made with Lightroom. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. That's the best part is when you order this book and then a week later, the UPS guy rings the door or the FedEx guy and you're like, you know what it is. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many times you've done it. It's still really cool. Even yeah. when you open it and I look at something and I go, oh, I can't believe I did that. It's still cool. Like, I made this? Yeah, I yeah. made this. Um, but going back to the questions about book right um, and, and you know, InDesign and different things, if you want to see what how you actually do your exports, um, this is all done, you know, in the library module. This is again where we're dealing with the the photo files and we're removing things around. Um, things are nicely pre-sorted here for me. Um, I can select all the images that I want. Go up here to export. There's a lot of different exports you can do. The first time you do it, you're going to want to just do regular um, export. Um, and here you can choose where to put it, and this is about being really organized as well. Yeah. Um, the sooner you adapt the system, the better off you're going to yeah, be. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's set up to just put it in like the pictures folder, which in a lot of people's pictures folder is just um, terrible and overstuffed with things. So it's a minefield. It is. Yeah. So you want to put it into a subfolder, um, and then you can also do some stuff where you can, you know, again we talked about like exporting only what you need, so you can. Um, you know, you can resize it to fit whatever you need in terms of DPI format and things like that. So, you know, if you're doing, if you're in InDesign, you're not dealing with these massive TIFF files and you know, kind of making just a, a, a yeah. project that's like way bigger. Than a massive it needs, upload than it needs to be. Yeah. Um, and then you'll export it. But it's talking about then the first time you've done it, and you're still working with that, and maybe you've changed some photos, and then you kind of you're using BookWrite, you're using InDesign. And you want to change that, you can then just do export with previous. Okay. And then that's going to use all those settings and it's going to put it in the exact same place. So that's going to save you um, a lot of time. And then yes. you can focus more on, on design. We want, we want people to do things that um, really save them time because it's the, it's the creative work that really, really matters. Say that one more time because it's really important. It's the creative work that really, really matters. It does. There's a lot of ways to get sort of hung up in the process, the camera you're using, the filters you're using, the DPI, all the tricks. But the reality of, of publications or making books is that the book is an object that lives on its own. And it's a sum of all of these different parts. And so you don't want to get hung up on that stuff. The, the key to bookmaking is the, crea the creative side and the design side. And it takes a little bit of study. 
it's a lot of fun to dive into the illustrated book world and learn about what's being done, what's been done in the past. It's really the important, important part of it. And these tools that we're showing you are to allow you to be efficient in the bookmaking process so that you don't get slowed down. If you have a vision of what you want your book to be, you want to get to that vision as quickly as you can. And that's what, to me, that's what this whole thing is about. By the way, I love the little Pentax camera. Yeah. But this is a, a tool that's just, it's about efficiency. It's about saying, you're, this is what I want things to look like, and that allows you to get to that, that spot very quickly. And for those people out there that maybe have been using Photoshop and they aren't sure they want to go to Lightroom, like they like the cataloging, but they're going to miss out on layering or they're going to miss out on you know the, the, the things they've come to grow and love, um, what's great is because it's Adobe and everything works together, you can um, actually open it in Adobe Photoshop. So nice. if there are things that you really do miss, things that you want back, you can still do that. Like my antiquated dodging and burning method? I yes. could open it in Photoshop, Photoshop. apply a 1992 technique to my images, and then go back into Lightroom. Yeah, absolutely. That is exactly what I need. So you never, you never have to feel like you're far from home. Awesome. Anything else out there from, from the people? I don't think so. There's a lot of people saying thank you. Great webinar. Uh, Peter from Belgium says hello. Oh, hey, Peter. And uh, I think that's pretty good. I think what it takes is practice. I think what you've given people is a nice overview of how it works. They need to dive into these modules and play with each one. And the other thing is, too, you can go in and mock up books and practice and delete that book and start over before you actually hit the print button. But I think that was, that was a good overview. Yeah, I, um, you know, I've been to some big um, Lightroom webinars where they kind of show you absolutely everything, and it's kind of intimidating. Yeah, I've sat through that multi-day <laughs> thing yeah. many times. It just bounced off. Right. It's great, and I should have retained it, but. And you know, I think uh, I think Adobe's still doing the thing where you can do um, you know a free trial for a month, and that's really the way to figure out if this is if this is kind of what you want. Yeah, I, pretty much every photographer I know that works professionally uses Lightroom. Yeah. That's that is one of the if not the program out there for people that are using it. So if they're using it, I know that it's more than capable for anything that I would possibly need. And hopefully, they're making books with it. They better be making books with it. That's the fun part. I think putting your, putting your work into print is the final chance that you have as an artist to leave your fingerprints on what it is that people use to take your work in. I think online, it's rare that people are looking at your work online and not doing something else at the same time. It's rare that you get undivided attention. But when you put a book in front of someone, literally the physical act of me handing this has become confrontational. You have to stop what you're doing and like pick this thing up. That's a really good thing. And like you said, you know, this is not exactly a huge financial investment here, no. but it's, it's, yeah. it works. So if I handed you a photo of Chicago, you oh. would feel compelled to look at it again? I would probably cry, like I always do. Yeah. But uh, yeah, once I got over it, I would you know, I'd keep writing you fan letters. All right. Um, so I think we're probably going to wrap up. We're going to wrap. Um, but anyway, everyone, uh, wait for the email that's going to come, and it's going to have that link that will give you 15% off the dynamic duo of uh, Photoshop and Lightroom. And uh, yeah, thank you. It. Make make amazing books or slideshows or you know what whatever you do. Just you know get a handle on, on on those photos that you are probably accumulating on your hard drive that maybe you looked at once when you posted them on uh, Facebook or Flickr and um, get them in print. Yeah, make good work. Thanks, All right. Ken. Thanks, Dan. Signing out. <laughs>